have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Song of Solomon, chapter number 4, and verse number 15. Song of Solomon, chapter number 4, verse 15. A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come, thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Father, bless this word now, living word as it goes forth. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be, you can be seated. The garden in the Song of Solomon was planted to the Lord. It's planted. She didn't plant it. God planted it. And it's his garden. And then he walled it in. Therefore, it became a very personal, private thing. And we'll get into a little detail in a few minutes about what's going on with this. But I want you to notice that when she calls out, she says, Awake, O north wind. She cries out for the wind to come into the garden. Now, the garden's there, the fruits are there, and the beauty's there, and the smell's there. But she wants the wind. The wind is not for her, the wind is for him. She wants the Holy Spirit, that's what that's talking about, to move in that garden. You see, the Lord smells a stench or he smells a sweet savor. The scripture says we are the smell or the, or the aroma of death unto death for those that don't know the Lord and the aroma of life unto life for those that do. And that's very important. When God gave you that ability to smell, oh, he gave you a defensive thing and it's also something that enhances your eating and it can be used in a lot of different ways, amen. And so keep in mind that these gifts of your body that the Lord's given you are every one there for reason. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, he, has set, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He was welcomed in, as I told you last week, as he approached the top of that mountain. Who can ascend into the presence of the Lord, the scripture says, and it gave the qualifications. There's only one that's qualified to do that, and that was the Son of God. He approached him, and he sat down. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit down until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Almighty called his son the Lord. God's not about to call something that he created God, but he certainly did him. Oh God. So we read over here in the Song of Solomon where she cries out for the wind to come and blow upon her garden. Now if you look in the book of Acts chapter number two, you'll find immediately upon the ascension of Christ that the wind comes down out of heaven, right? As a rushing mighty wind and it fills the house where they were sitting. And 16 different nationalities or tongues were present that day. And every man heard in his own language the works of God. It was a proof positive that the Holy Spirit had been sent as a universal present for all mankind. Not just some small group of elect, but for every last one. But this follows immediately upon the death of Christ. He sends the Holy Spirit. Now this is what's important about this. The Bible said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ... He's none of his. Well, what's he talking about? Well, the Holy Spirit's what he's talking about. But the Holy Ghost takes on an entirely new identity when he comes being sent. You see, he's sent as an apostle, sent with authority, sent with power, sent to exercise that authority and power in the name of Christ as Christ comes into this world. That's important. What that means is tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ is everything. He's everything there ever will be. He's everything there ever has been. And he's all that matters now. And so when you gauge everything you say, you sing, you preach, you do, you compare it to Christ. Let it be, let it be exposed in the light of Christ. Who's the Son of God and how does this relate to him? Like I told you last week, I had much rather have my, sab my Sabbath, my rest in a person than in a day. Think that through. Amen. It is his call to the Spirit to come in John chapter 14. He said, I'll pray the Father and he'll send you another comforter. His description of the new birth in John chapter number 3. He said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell from whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Man started with the breath of God. Amen. That breath of God came directly forth from the Lord. Nothing, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that God ever breathed into an animal. He never breathed into an angel. He didn't breathe into a cherubim or a seraphim, but he breathed into the man. 
That breath, therefore, was the source of life for the man. God doesn't need to breathe, does he? He doesn't need anything. If he needed breath, my dear friend, then that means he needs something. He needs nothing. He exists because he exists. I am that I am. And therefore, that's who he is. He needs nothing. The book says in Matthew chapter number 24, he'll send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So the Bible tells you that there are four distinct winds in the earth, north wind, east wind, south wind, west wind. The scripture has something to say about each one of these winds in its direction. The book of Ezekiel chapter 37 verse nine says this. He said unto me, prophesy to the wind, prophesy son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. As wind or breath gave them life to begin with, wind or breath gives them life again. Amen. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So what is the identity of these winds? Well, the east wind, the north wind, the south wind, and the west wind. Let's talk about the east wind, for example. Genesis chapter number 41, verse 23 says, And behold, seven ears, withered, thin, and blasted, with the east wind sprung up after them. Now, what is this? This is a vision that God had given Joseph about what was coming to Egypt. He told him there's going to be seven prosperous years, all the food you can eat, then there's going to be seven years of famine. And so God used Joseph to prepare the world to be able to live and prosper and survive through this plague. Exodus chapter number 10 verse 13 says, Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locust. What about that? Now look at Exodus 14 verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. See that? All that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. God can use natural things to perform a miracle. That's exactly what he did. He used a natural thing to perform a miracle. But if you notice that this cleansing, powerful, almighty wind comes from the east, that's important to remember that. Important. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 8 says, In measure, when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. He stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind. And then Job 1,900 years before Christ said this, The east wind carried him away, carrieth him away, and he departeth, and as a storm hurleth him out of his place. If you lived in Southern California, or any of the area around there, or you have lived, and some of these folks watching this tonight no doubt are in that area, they'll know what I'm talking about. It's the Santa Ana winds. How many's ever heard of it? Some of you have. Santa Ana winds. Sometimes called the devil winds. Strong, extremely dry, downslope winds that originate inland and affect coastal Southern California and Northern Baja California. They originate from cool, dry, high-pressure air masses in the Great Basin. The geography of this country is quite, uh, quite remarkable. There's a huge area out west that encompasses two or three states. That's a basin. In other words, it's not a watershed where the water comes in and it moves on out. It comes in and stays in. So it changes the ecology and it changes the atmosphere and it changes things. And the wind blows across that. It's kind of like the Dead Sea. All this water from the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. But because it has nowhere to go, what happens to the water? It evaporates. And as it evaporates, it leaves behind all of these deposits of minerals. The Dead Sea is, I don't know what it is, three, four, five, six, seven times saltier than the ocean. And you can literally go out and sit down in the water of the Dead Sea and just sit there and float. It's quite remarkable. It's buoyant. You sure is. There's no question about that. I've seen it a number of times. But the thing is, the Santa Ana winds are known for the hot, dry weather that they bring in autumn, often the hottest of the year, but they can also arise at other times of the year. They often bring the lowest relative humidities of the year. In other words, dry air. 
uh, to coastal Southern California and beautifully clear skies. These low humidities combined with a warm, compressionally heated air mass plus high wind speeds create critical fire weather conditions and fan destructive wildfires. Has not California been burning? Now you're learning why it's been burning and this applies to it. And quickly I'll move through it, it says this. In December 2011, the Santa Ana winds were the strongest yet recorded and atmospheric uh, setup occurred that allowed the towns of Pasadena and Altadena and the San Gabriel Valley to get whipped by sustained winds of 97 miles per hour. That's a category two hurricane, folks. That's a lot of winds. Now you say, well, now why is that important? Well, the Bible says as the lightning flashes in the east and you see it in the west, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. When they laid out the tabernacle, folks, they didn't just stick it out there. That tabernacle was laid out directly according to the geographic location of the earth. To enter from that, to into that tabernacle, you had to come from the east. It was always facing the east. Therefore, the approach unto the holiest place on this earth was from the east to the west. And you had to go through three distinct chambers to get to that holy place. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to come from the east. He went from the Mount of Olives. He ascended from the Mount of Olives, which is east from Jerusalem. And he said, the angel said, why stand you here gazing? This same Jesus shall so come again in like manner. My dear friend, if that's not the fire of God coming, I don't know what is. The Bible says, I saw heaven open, behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he that judge and make war. Amen. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp two-edged sword, that with it he should judge the nations. And he had a name written, his name is called the Word of God. Amen. Amen. So that east wind is something we best be looking out for. Amen. Now the north wind, as it comes, it comes down, obviously, from the north. Here's what it says in the book of Job. Chapter 37, fair weather cometh out of the north, with God is terrible majesty. Proverbs 25, 23, the north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance, a backbiting tongue. Ezekiel 1, verse 4, and I looked and behold, watch this, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof is the color of amber. Out of the midst of the fire came what? It came a throne that had wheels that was moving about, showing the sovereignty of God, even though his people were in captivity. He was still on the throne. Nothing had changed about that. But where did it come from? It came from the north. You see, it, that which comes from the north cleanses. It purifies. It prepares the individual the type of the Holy Spirit comes and cleanses and prepares you to receive the blessing of God by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Listen, without him you can do nothing. Without him you can do nothing. The Apostle Paul says, I am nothing. Now we need to remind ourselves that tonight. Anything that is worked up, uh, you know, trumped up, whatever, if, whatever you want to call it, uh, it may look good, sound good, and in all appearances be good. But the truth of the matter is, without the anointing and unction of the Holy Ghost, it's dead works. You know why? Because if it's done without the anointing of God, if it's done without the counsel of God, if it's done without the presence of God, if it's done without calling upon the Lord for his strength and for his power, it's your doing. It's you doing it. And he's not going to bless it. So it comes from the north. Amen. And Job said, fair weather cometh out of the north. Well, hallelujah. Ask the Holy Ghost. Ask God to send the Holy Ghost and cleanse you from your soul. Now, the south wind, we read in the Song of Solomon chapter number four, O fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden that the spices thereof may flow out. See that smell? You can smell that. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. You see, God has blessed you with the ability to smell a dead body. <laughs> and so by therefore smelling that dead body, what does that say? Don't eat this. I mean, you find something decaying on the side of the road. You see, but there's a vast difference between you and a dog. Don't want to make anybody mad in that. But you see, it's something that eats carry-on. Mm -hmm. 
dead things. You got to watch them. Throughout the Bible, God calls it unclean. From Genesis to Revelation. That's right. Decaying. And we don't have anything to do with that. So south wind, as she cries out, let the south wind blow upon my garden. So what does that mean? Well, that means the comforting wind that comes from the south. You see, once God has cleansed the soul, purged it, and if he needs to, he'll put you through the uh, chastisement, but that's okay. That shows you that he loves you and that you belong to him. Chastisement is not necessarily punishment, folks. I've said time and again, chastisement is instructive. Riot, it's remedial. It's something that's done to try to encourage you, teach you, show you, guide you, direct you. And, uh, and this is what happens with it. So we read in the Job, book of Job chapter 37, how thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. Second Corinthians chapter number two gets very specific. Listen to this in verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. That's a smell, folks. We are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. The Bible said, I'm accepted in the beloved. Aren't you glad that when he sees you, he doesn't see you, he sees Christ? My life is hid with Christ in God. Remember what I said about that? Remember I told you how that Satan has no idea what the new birth is? He doesn't know what it is. He can't know it. And if you don't blabble around and tell him audibly what your prayer is, he doesn't know what you're praying. Your life is hidden and your prayer is hidden. Amen. And that's a good thing. He already knows too much about me. I don't tell him anymore. <laughs> In them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death. And to the other the savor of life unto life. And who's sufficient for these things? Well, that's, that's, you know, that's beautiful. This, don't you think? The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14, and, uh, 14 through 16. That's beautiful talk. Ephesians 5, 2 says, And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a what? Sweet smelling savor. See that? The scripture says that he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. His body was racked with pain. His body was suffering. No question about it. Would not take one thing away from the horror of crucifixion. No way in the world. But his soul was also suffering. Yes, it was. And he saw the travail of his soul. You see, the suffering of the soul was not a physical suffering of the body. The suffering of the soul had to do with a spiritual war that he was engaged in while he was on that cross. The west wind, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 22, it says, And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot. And get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Oh my goodness, we've been in a here we are. We've we've been in drought for ye, a drought for years. Good night, and all of a sudden this prophet says it's going to rain. Get ready, the rain's coming. It's just a little cloud. The great sea is what he's talking about. The Mediterranean. You can stand at the top of Carmel. I've been up there, and you can look over and see the Mediterranean, and there you can see he saw that saw that hand coming. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 45, it came to pass in the meanwhile, the heaven was black with clouds and the wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. So from the west comes the rain. And I told you about being in the Holy Land in, uh, I don't know, I forget now, June, July, somewhere in there. And it wasn't the rainy season, but man, did the sky turn black and the wind started rolling. And I'm from East Tennessee. I said, we better find us a place, buddy. <laughs> It's going to be pouring the rain. I said that to our guide. He said, don't worry about it, son. He said, it won't rain a drop. I said, you kidding. He said, it won't rain a drop. But that wind was blowing and it turned black. And I mean to tell you, it was time to, it didn't rain a drop. Not a drop. You see, he sends the former rain, the latter rain. The rain comes at a specific time for the children of Israel. Reason for that, he said, if you obey me, keep my commandments, my statutes, and do what I say to do, he says, I will not bring any of the afflictions upon you that are brought upon the Egyptians. And he did bring them upon the Egyptians. He brought one after another upon the Egyptians. He said, but the land that you're going into is not like Egypt. He said, it's a land of milk and honey. All it needs is water. It's some of the most fertile soil on the face of the earth. All it needs is water. 
Now, Egypt waters its land by the Nile River. This thing down in the geography, it's called the pride of the Nile. And you can look at it from above and you'll see where the water comes out at a certain time of the year. And you can see exactly how far out it comes. And so they plant down. See, Egypt is a desert, the Sahara Desert. But that area next to the Nile River goes out so far, there they plant their crops. Or if they're able to irrigate them in certain places. And they can count on that. They count on Mother Nature, if that's what you want to call her. That's who feeds them. But not Israel. The Lord said, you go into this land. He said, I'll send you the former rain and the latter rain. He said, you depend upon me, and that rain will come. And when you, he said, if you, if you disobey my commandments, he said, I'll shut up heaven. And this is what had happened. He shut it up, you see. And the moment he shut heaven up, they went into, a, into a, you know, starving, famine. And, uh, and it brought it upon them. But once God called his prophet, Elijah, called him out. There was the deliverer, Elijah, Elijah, that was his name. You remember Yah, Jehovah, Eli, Elohim is Jehovah. In other words, God, the God of Israel, is the true God, Jehovah. And he was up against Baal, felt sorry for Baal that day. Terrible, you know, it's kind of like that one up there in Philistine land. Who was that God that just couldn't keep him propped up? Felt sorry for Dagon too, it's terrible. I'm sure that all these pagan gods out there don't like the idea when the true Jehovah shows up, do they? No, they don't like that a bit. <laughs> and that's what happened. Amen. The west wind. In Genesis 2, the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now note carefully, he didn't create his soul. He became a living soul. It's kind of like our Lord Jesus Christ because you see, this is the first Adam. Christ is the last Adam. There's so many things about the first Adam and the last Adam that are so close to each other. Now, the first Adam was a man of the earth, earthy. But the last Adam is the Lord from heaven, remember? Came down from above. He took a body here. He didn't bring the body from above now. The blood did not come down from above, folks. The blood came from a body that came from here. But the second person of the Trinity of the Godhead came from above. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord Jesus Christ has always been, will always be. All right, never was a moment that he was not, always and forever. But the God-man, the God-man, when God became a man, when God had blood, when God had flesh. Look at John chapter number 6. Look at it closely. He said, except you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no part of me in you there's no part here. And this goes in direct contradiction to what he told them in the Old Testament. You don't eat the flesh of a human being. That's a cannibal. You don't do that. And so they said to themselves, this is a hard saying. How in the world? He said, the words that I give you, they are spirit and they are life. All right? So it's an absolute futile thing for you to gather every Sunday and take anything and try to turn it in to the body and blood of Christ. Amen. Folks, if you had his literal blood, and I want to be as, Lord of mercy tonight, as I can possibly be, if you had his literal blood and body and you could eat it, it would not save you. You are saved by what he did at the cross, by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what saves what Christ did on the tree. That's what saves us. But we have those who, they call it transubstantiation. They say, well, uh, it's not a bloody sacrifice. It's a non-bloody, but it's not necessary. Why do you have to have a sacrifice every week? Right. He offered himself one time. Yeah. One time. Hebrew says one time. He offered himself without sin. And so there's no need to continue something that was finished when he did it. But he said in John 3, the wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof, canst not tell from whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Notice how that the new birth is like the wind blowing. You remember? We came into being because of the wind, the breath of God. The breath of God brought us here. When a man passes from this earth, man or woman, they expire. I remember, never forget him telling me that I was with my grandfather in 1969. At UT Hospital, the nurse came to the room and she says, your grandfather has expired. 
She used what's called a euphemism. What's that? That's a word that takes the bite away. In other words, she's saying he's dead. He has just died. But a euphemism kind of, you know, buffers it and makes it not quite as cutting. He has expired. What's that mean? He has breathed out his last. To inspire means to breathe in. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Theos noustos. God noustos breathes. He breathes his word. He breathes it when he writes it. That's inspired. And he breathes it when it comes into you. Because the word of God is still alive. You receive a living thing. Amen. So you have something alive in you tonight. Amen. Think about that at 2 o'clock in the morning. You've got something alive in you. Amen. It's the word of God. You say, well, it'll die soon. No, 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 no. You may die, but the word will never die. Oh, no, no. It's alive. <laughs> yes, sir. And I'm all glad for it, too. Believe me. I'm glad for it. I am. Because I don't have to keep myself alive. He keeps me alive. Amen. Amen. <laughs> In John 20, this is a beautiful thing. When he said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, that didn't happen in Acts 2. In Acts 2, the Spirit came down. You know, it was a mighty rushing wind. And most believe that this was the birth of the New Testament church. We, knew, we know what it says in Hebrews 9, without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. We know that. We know until Christ died on the cross, there was no New Testament covenant. There was no new covenant because it is the New Testament in his blood. So therefore, he had to die on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he was buried and then he, was rose, he rose again the third day. And by that resurrection from the dead, he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. In plainer words, the stamp was put upon him. It cannot be moved. The seal of God, this is my son. And that can't be changed the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And so he sends the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. It comes down. And today, you know, for some soul, they may mean well. They say, well, now, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they get that from the book of Acts where Priscilla and Aquila found a disciple of John the Baptist, Apollos, and he was out preaching, knowing only the baptism of John. He was doing what he knew to do. He's following the light he had. There's nothing wrong with Apollos, not a thing. Then he was presented with more light, and because he had the right light and because he had the truth as it was up until that point, he had no problem accepting the truth as it went further. Now, that's a principle, and that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And so when they came to him and said, no, no, you, well, what you've got's fine, but there's more now. And they finished the gospel message with him, and he had no problem. He accepted it right on the spot, and Apollos went out, and he was eloquent. He was eloquent. He was a speaker. He went out and began to preach the word of God. But, uh, you know, they asked the disciples there, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. That's a very important thing and interesting, don't you think? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they said, we haven't heard so much about a Holy Spirit. It's not until you get to the Gospel of John till you start hearing about the Holy Ghost. You start hearing about the Holy Ghost in the Gospel of John when you start hearing about the new birth. Remember that? And in Matthew, we've got the kingdom of heaven here on this earth, the gospel of the kingdom, Christ preaching it, the, you know, the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, and all of that. But there's not a word about the kingdom of heaven in the gospel of John. The reason for that is because the gospel of John was the last gospel written in the New Testament. And it was after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. There was never any doubt in anyone's mind. The kingdom of heaven was in abeyance. The king had been rejected. And so the gospel was going forth to the ends of the earth, to Jew and Gentile. Made no difference whatsoever. And the new birth was being preached. And the gospel of John is the book that preached it. And that's what you got. That's what you got. And the Holy Spirit now has been given. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have truly believed, you've got the Holy Ghost. And don't let some poor old misguided soul ask you if you've received the Holy Ghost since you believed. The Bible said, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's what? The Bible says you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the seal of the Holy Spirit. It is the unction, it is the, it is the down payment of our inheritance. That's what the Holy Spirit is. The surety of it. So yes, sir, if you are born again tonight, you have the Holy Ghost. 
But really the best question you can ask is not whether you have the Holy Ghost. Does the Holy Ghost have you? <laughs> I want to read something to you. This was written in the 1500s. I just found this today. and I, I didn't, I'd never seen it before. 1500s, now we're talking 16th century. Listen to this, 1500s. Western, and it's anonymous. They don't know who wrote this. Western wind, when wilt thou blow, the small rain down can rain. Christ, if my love were in my arms, and I in my bed again. There's no doubt that this is a reference to the Song of Solomon and asking for the Lord Jesus to come back that he or she, whoever wrote this, wants fellowship with the Lord. Now think of that. This is in the 1500s. This is 500 years ago. The people are talking back then just like we talk today. Hunger for the Lord. Hunger for the Lord. Now I was listening to Johnny last night, Johnny Erickson Tata, and she gave a remarkable testimony about her present life. I just jotted it down. Here's what she said. She said, it is no easy task getting me to sleep. She says, I mean, I'm a quadriplegic with all kinds of issues. So the other night, Ken, that's her husband, helped put on my lymphatic sleeve. My chin strap, my mask, hooked me up to my ventilator, fed it into my oxygen, then positioned the pillows. Now this is an every night occasion. Imagine now, every night when you go to bed. Then he asked, are you all set? She said, I was thinking of the claustrophobia, thinking of the pain that I would no doubt face in the night. And I asked him, through many layers of my stuff, please, this is her prayer to her husband, please pray that my faith will not fail. That's real. This is not a put on show. This is, this is not church fakery. This is not the phony garbage you hear. Please pray that my faith will not fail. You see, none of us is above falling flat on our face spiritually. Amen, sister. I readily agree with you. No one has a faith that is all figured out and neatly packaged. She has a way with words. So if you are in trouble spiritually, it is okay to ask a friend, pray that my faith not fail. Oh, and by the way, I did make it through that awful night. God bless you, Johnny. You have blessed me unbelievably time and time and time again. And so when I start mumbling and moaning and grappling and complaining and kicking the slats out of my crib and throwing my rattler out on the floor, you know, refusing my uh, formula, I can think about somebody like that. It makes a difference. Now this is Sean Eidelmeyer. He just sent these in. And this is, this is one young man who loves the Lord. He's in Haiti. The reason I do this tonight is because how many of you know what's going on in Haiti? We need to pray for him. I mean, he is in a, he's in a terrible place. But he sent these photographs, and I'll leave them up here, and you all can look at them after the service. Here's a lady that's got the Bible, La Sainte Bible. Now, there's a lot of French. Uh, Haiti was a French colony, so there's a lot of French mixed in with their language, and I'm not exactly sure uh, what's it called in New Orleans, the mixture of French and English, Cajun? What is it? Creole. Creole, Creole, there you go. And so it may be a lot of that here. This lady right here is holding up the Bible. But he talks about this young man right here. It's quite a thing. He said he shows up at his door every day. He wants to read the Bible. He's reading the scripture. He loves the Bible. You got that? And then here is, uh, here they're helping each other. They're helping each other which is, that's the way it ought to be. They're helping. I'll just leave them up here. There's no way I, you all can see all of it. And then here he stands with some of these kids that he loves. Let's pray that nothing happens to Sean. I love this brother. He loves the Lord. and I can't, you look at his face. You talk about a happy. <laughs> this guy is where God wants him to be. 
He's doing exactly what the Lord wants him to do. Now, what more could you ask for than that? I mean, he's happy. And uh, so I'll leave them laying right there for you tonight. And I'll give you that as a prayer request. Please pray for Sean Eidelmeyer. And I was watching the news today, and they interviewed a missionary. And apparently a lot of churches and a lot of uh, organizations have missionaries and mission work in Haiti right now. And I'm sure that they're worried about their missionaries and worried about what's going on. So please remember them in prayer. Folks, if you don't know what's happening in, in Haiti, there's a guy down there right now who's, who's, a, uh, who's a lord, a warlord of one of the gangs which are trying to overthrow the government. And I think that the prime minister, I think that's his title of president, whatever he is, has resigned. And now they're, they're going to have to create a new government. But this guy is, has been burning people alive. And he doesn't stop at that. And I'm not going to get into it tonight. You'd have to have a strong stomach to be able to handle what I'm talking about. But please pray for these kids right here. They need, these kids need something better than that, don't they? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. You get the right kind of leadership in down there, and these kids will have something to eat. And, and Haiti. And Haiti will be able to prosper. They're trying. The Dominican Republic. Hey, it's one island. Haiti's on one end, and the Dominican Republic's on the other. And they've got a border uh, separating the two countries. And the Haitians are trying their best to get across the border into the Dominican Republic. And I don't blame them. They're fleeing. They're, they're refugees. They're fleeing what's happening. So please pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for Johnny. Pray for Johnny. Amen. Please pray for them. And I have a special prayer request to my family. God knows what it is. Lord knows. He knows. And please pray for me. I need your prayers. And we have, if you haven't been reading on the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uploaded, the uh, YouTube uh, channels, you ought to go in there and start reading. The people are already responding to what I said about praying for each other. They're starting to pray for each other. And a number of them have gone to that man that was so angry, so angry, and they started responding to him and praying for him, and now he is beginning to respond. And so that's a good thing. Amen. So thank the Lord for that. Does anybody have a prayer request tonight? Yes, sir.